everyone. Thank you all for joining us today for our Vendor Contract Management for Beginners webinar. My name is Jesse Redmond, and I will be your host. On your screen, you should see multiple widgets that you can use, including Ask Question, Media Player, Slides, Related Content, Speaker Bio, Request Demo, and Help. If you're not familiar with our webinars, all the widget boxes are resizable and movable, so feel free to move them around to maximize your screen space. At the bottom of your screen in the toolbar are icon buttons you can use to show and hide the widgets. You can expand your slide area or maximize it to full screen by clicking on the arrows in the top right corner of the widget. If you experience any issues or have technical questions, you can use the help widget or submit them along with any other questions through the ask question widget. Don't worry, we do capture all questions throughout the session. We will be answering some during the webcast, but those that we do not have a chance to answer live, we will address with you via email. Today's live session is eligible for one CPE credit. If you wish to receive this credit, please remember to answer all of the polling questions that will appear on your screen during today's presentation. You will also be sent a follow-up survey link 24 hours after the live session that will need to be completed in order to receive the CPE credit. With us today, we have Kelly Vick, VinMinder's president. She will help you understand vendor contracts and the overall contracting process. Kelly will guide you through the basics, show examples, and explain specific contract considerations and objectives to know. You will see a link to a copy of today's slide deck, a link to our website, a link to our samples library, links to our How to Master Vendor Contract Management eBook, eight vendor service level agreement best practices infographic, what to consider for vendor contract renegotiations or amendments infographic, as well as a link to our additional resources in the related content widget. With all that being said, I'd like to hand it over to Kelly. Kelly, the floor is yours. So taking a quick review of the agenda, you'll see that we're going to first start uh, by spending some time uh, reviewing or doing an overview of vendor contracts and why they're so important to you. Then we'll move into talking about service level agreements. And another topic that is very important is talking about why ongoing um, contract management is as important as uh, putting the contract in place. And then we'll end looking at ways, um, talking about ways contracts can actually terminate. So let's dive in. So let's start by talking about what uh, vendor contract management actually means. Uh, so contract management is uh, simply the oversight of written agreements that you have in place with vendors or suppliers that you have chosen uh, from whom you are purchasing software, services, materials, et cetera. Contract management includes many things. One is negotiating those contract terms to ensure that all of the terms, the provisions, the controls that are important to you um, are are identified and covered in the contract. Hopefully you discovered those controls that are necessary during your assessment and due diligence phase, but it's important that you pull that into the contract during contract management. It also includes a process for ensuring that the contract is reviewed, approved, and executed properly. So your third-party risk management program should specify how contracts are to be managed within your organization. It could, should cover things like who can sign the contracts, what contract value requires uh, board approval possibly, um, maybe some minimum um, language, minimum provisions that have to be in place such as minimum indemnification, minimum limitation of liability, minimum confidentiality provisions, things like that. Contract management also includes ensuring that all of your vendor contracts, regardless of the value of that contract, are stored in a central repository with proper controls. Uh, this is so important because we have worked with many clients who, when onboarding them onto our vendor management platform, they just don't know where to find all their contracts. It's a common challenge that we see routinely. And then contract management also includes the ongoing maintenance of that contract 
along with the maintenance of that vendor relationship. And you're doing that to make sure that the vendor is in compliance with the terms of the contract. Um, it also allows you to ensure that critical dates and other critical requirements, such as SLAs, are managed. So basically, contract management um, is not a one-and-done process. It um, can be very time-consuming. Uh, it can be very difficult to manage uh, a, a, a part of the third-party risk management program that does take some time and diligence on your part. Uh, but it is particularly important to make sure that, um, especially if you're in somewhat of a decentralized um, environment, that you have some good controls around the vendor contract management across all of those departments that are taking part in um, those relationships with those vendors. So let's talk just a moment about why vendor contract management is important. Um, first and foremost, it certainly helps to create a powerful um, and legally binding business relationship. Negotiating the contract with your third-party vendor is um, a very important tool to ensure that you uh, it can have some direct influence over the expectations that you have with that uh, third party. It is legally binding, but it also helps set the tone for the relationship going forward. Contract management with appropriate controls and process brings visibility into the company, um, especially visibility around company spend, uh, visibility around um, how well the relationship with the vendor is going, uh, visibility into other costs around supporting it, and, and hopefully will then potentially um, allow you to identify whether there are any cost savings that go along with that particular vendor along the way. Planning ahead and making sure that appropriate contractual commitments um, are in the contract is important. Um, and again, as I mentioned on the uh, previous slide, hopefully you uncovered some of those maybe gaps or just controls that you want to make sure um, are solidified in the contract. You discovered those during the initial assessment, assessment and due diligence review. And so that's part of the reason why you do that. First, you want to know who your vendor is, but you also want to be able to figure out what needs to be um, con contracted. And then, of course, um, contract management is a requirement in all the major financial regulatory guidance, um, and many of them, the FDIC, OCC, FFIC, and the new um, uh, the new interagency guidelines have some very prescriptive steps for contracts. So those are good places to look to find out exactly what should be done. And it's important to remember that this written agreement is your leverage, again, in managing that relationship. Hopefully it's a good partnership and you want it to be a good partnership, but there could be times when you need to um, lean on the contract language to ensure that uh, you're getting what you need out of that relationship with that vendor. So who is generally involved in the contract management process? You can see here what I have what I have said is that there's generally some primary constituents and then some collaborators. And in any organization, the uh, parties named under each of these could be different. So the, I'm not trying to say that this is exactly how it needs to be because that will absolutely depend on your organization. But the point is, is that there are probably some departments, some people in your company who are who should be involved in every contract, legal to some extent for sure, uh, the business owner who is managing that relationship probably has a stake in this process as well. And of course, vendor risk management, compliance, whatever department you may have. Some collaborators that are important to um, be a part of this process because they are the subject matter experts for reviewing the contract language with you um, might be information technology. Procurement probably has a hand in the process around it. Um, information security to ensure those controls that we talked about, likely your finance team. Uh, there could be others that, um, de again, depending on your organization, would be a part of this process. Again, the point to make with this is that there should be multiple people within the organization, depending on the vendor contract you are working on to put in place right now, should be involved. It should not be a one-person show because 
there's just a lot of constituents in the organization that have a part in that relationship. So try to write your um, program such that it does require involvement from the stakeholders at hand. So up to this point, we have talked about the what, the why, and the who. And so now we're going to dive into some nitty gritty details about the contract language. On this page, what you are reviewing are all of the major elements or provisions uh, that should be included in your vendor contracts. This slide has been updated since the most recent um, regulatory guidance that came out um, last month, maybe. I can't remember exactly when it came out. Um, but if you've been to a few other of our um, contracting webinars or our boot camps, you wouldn't have seen this many items on this slide. And now I have moved some that were on an optional, only needed for high risk and critical vendor contracts over into really all contracts. But this is a, a long list. And um, this covers you know, your typical legally sections that need to be covered on all of your vendor relationships. If you are in the financial institution um, industry, this is very clear. This is spelled out very cl clearly in all of the regulations that you have access to, whether it is the interagency guidelines or OCC or FDIC. Um, or, or FFIEC, that all of them, you can reference them and get all of these details. But again, this has been updated with the interagency guidelines that have just been um, that have just been made effective. These are the um, essential elements that need to be included, and your contract, whether prepared for out for, for you by your internal or external legal counsel or contracts that are presented to you by your vendors need to indeed include all of this language. And if they do not, then this is where those negotiation tactics that need to be used that we talked about earlier come into play to ensure that you are protecting your organization in all of these areas. Um, you'll notice there's lots of um, specific details necessary around this. This is these are just the highlighted subsections and so there's lots of details that go, would go in behind this, but use this as your checklist, if you will, uh, to ensure that your vendor contracts are indeed compliant with these major elements. So as I just referenced, um, there are some additional provisions that um, would be reserved or necessary for your critical or high risk vendor contracts in addition to the long list that you saw on the previous page. Um, and just to point, point out a few of these, um, information security um, is of course a, um, a, a critical, very critical item to include and have far more structure in your contract and details in your contract for your critical and high risk vendors. Um, that would be a, a big one. Customer complaint management is another one that should be covered. Um, regulatory supervision. I mean, this is very important for you to um, ensure with these critical and high-risk vendors that you are going to get the support from these vendors that you need as it relates to you being uh, supervised by your regulators. Um, data protection um, as well as data processing, and you may even have a data processing agreement in place with these vendors. Um, data retention, definitely the disclosure of those critical fourth parties we've been talking about and their access to them, that right to audit we've mentioned, further uh, details around business continuity and disaster recovery planning and testing to include probably a uh, summary or detailed um, detailed summary of their actual testing results. And if you have foreign-based third parties, uh, and they're critical and high risk, which they should be if they're foreign based, then that uh, you would need to cover that uh, requirement off as far as what you might need from that vendor to ensure 
that they are mitigating any risk in that area. And then there could be other items that you want to include uh, that would be different for your critical and high risk vendors like maintenance requirements or maybe approvals for certain um, changes within their processes or personnel possibly. Um, so again, uh, contracts are you know very um, detailed and you know what is that devil is in the detailed comment it, it definitely stands true for these third party risk vendor contracts and especially for those that present a high risk to you because of the data that they have access to. So let's take just a moment and talk about some common mistakes to avoid. Um, I, probably the first one is definitely um, not to execute a contract without properly vetting and um, assessing the risk of that vendor and documenting it. It's very critical to have that documented as well. We see that th this mistake probably be the easiest one to make. I'm not getting appropriate approval, whether it's senior management approval or board approval for the contract and the relationship dependent upon what your um, uh, your TPRM program and policy state. Um, lack of proper contract tracking and lack of a repository. I believe I mentioned that a couple of slides ago that we see that very regularly that people just don't know where to find all their contracts. Not defining roles and responsibilities within the contract, especially as it relates to the performance of that vendor that needs to be very clearly identified in the contract. And not having a periodic review of the vendor, including a review of the contract. So let's definitely find ways to avoid those mistakes. Be sure your processes are built around them. And this brings us to the first poll question of the day. You should see the poll question now in the slides area. If you have any issues, please feel free to send us a message using the Ask Question widget, and we will be happy to assist. As a reminder, if you wish to receive the CPE credit for today's session, you must answer all poll questions and be in attendance for the entire live session. This poll question is, in your organization, where does contract management sit? Which line of business or function? Compliance, risk management, executive management or the board, Information technology, a general counsel, inside a line of business or department, such as marketing, etc., or you don't know. Kelly, we have some time now to answer one of the questions that has come in from the audience. And that question is, what are our chances that we what are our chances that one of our vendors would agree to renegotiate a contract that is midterm? Well, I think that will depend on your relationship that you have with that vendor. Um, I have seen uh, that go both ways. I've experienced um, really more on the positive side of working with um, a customer or working with a vendor to have modifications made for any number of reasons. Primarily, you would see that need to come up um, if there are regulatory changes, maybe with all the recent um, privacy laws people are requesting some additional language in the do in the contracts around that. There could be other reasons, though. Um, and what you might find is that there has to be some kind of skin in the game for those kind of um, in um, in contract term changes to be made, such as maybe they request some. Um, additional term to the contract or something like that. Um, but I think it really does truly depend on the relationship that you have. And hopefully you have a more of a partnership relationship with your vendors um, so that you, when things like that come up, um, hopefully do have a positive reaction to that request. Thanks, everyone, for answering that poll question. Here are those results. By the way, you may have noticed reactions, such as a thumbs up or heart, coming across the screen. If you find this feature distracting, you can turn it off by clicking the four arrows in the top right-hand corner of the Slides widget, which will expand the slides to full screen and no longer show the reactions. Before we move on, as a reminder, in the Related Content widget, you'll find a helpful resource to reference, which is our How to Master Vendor Contract Management eBook. This eBook walks you through five pages of contract management. So we have covered contract management pretty thoroughly. 
So let's now shift our attention and talk about service level agreements in further detail. We've always put emphasis on SLAs, but since the pandemic, which I know we don't like to talk about, but it happened and it changed a lot of things, we, it really brought more attention and heightened our awareness of the need for SLAs uh, when we may not have thought they were that important. So what is an SLA? Well, it is an agreement, um, and it clearly spells out the performance expectations and how that performance will be measured or measured, pretty plain and simple. A service level agreement should be a key component of every contract with your third party vendors or at least your critical ones. Um, in addition to defining what's expected, the SLA should also detail how the service is to be measured as well as what happens if it isn't met. Um, we're going to talk more about SLAs in the coming slides, but that just gives you a brief summary of what they are. So just why are SLAs so important? Well, I mentioned just a moment ago that they became more relevant, maybe, or heightened awareness since the pandemic. Um, but they've been around and should have been around with your critical vendors even before that. Just we noticed them more. But we've already mentioned that SLAs define how your vendor's product or service is expected to perform. This SLA helps give you some peace of mind that the vendor will hopefully be compliant and not um, become complacent in, their, in providing the support to you and the services to you. If the SLA is established properly and has good parameters and, and guidelines and measurements built around it, then they can certainly help drive efficiency with your vendor because both of you know exactly what's expected of you. And, and hopefully your vendor knows that they are on guard because you're monitoring their performance. The SLA should generally be centered around um, your customer's experience. And in most instances, these vendors are going to be providing some kind of service that ultimately the end user or customer uh, will benefit from, whether directly or indirectly. But what you certainly want is to make sure that these SLAs are a key element in making sure that your customers continue to be satisfied with you. So if you look at it, in a different way, your vendor's performance is certainly a reflection of your performance. It's also very important to establish the measurable standards and to identify what's most important to measure because I've seen SLAs where they can become overly complicated and what happens is it's um, too difficult to measure and so therefore it doesn't really get measured and monitored. If the SLAs aren't being met, the remedies or penalties um, should have already been established in these SLAs so that there is no misunderstanding of what the um, consequences are if the vendor does not perform. You can also use these SLAs to monitor your vendor's performance for early warning signs of bigger issues that could be appearing. So if you're not already doing this, now is the time to pay close attention to the SLAs in your vendor contracts. Much like the conversation that we had a few slides ago about who is involved in contract management, the same is true with who should be involved with drafting SLAs. There's likely some primary people involved in that and then collaborators across the organization who should also be involved in that. The people who are supporting the product or service and delivering the product and service on the vendor side are the boots on the ground people who, who really know the most about what, um, what, how, how the product or service performs and what should be expected of it. So to me, in my opinion, they would be your primary ones. I, I should state here too that this list would could be different for each one of you. So it depends on, again, how your third-party risk management program has established these um, priorities and, and established your processes. But you should have collaborators across the organization because you know, there are others that should have a stake in ensuring that SLAs are written appropriately, that they cover the important things for the business, and that the right people 
have their eyes on it to ensure that it is um, sound a sound business and and contract document that will hold weight. So uh, depending again on your organization, you will have multiple people involved in the process of writing and drafting and solidifying SLAs. So let's take a deeper look at what should be included in the SLA. And there are many factors that will need to be considered when deciding what information is most important for your organization, for this vendor, and for the solution that this vendor is providing. On this slide are some guidelines on what should be included in every SLA, and I'll just cover a few. Um, one, of course, is expectations and goals. And this is, you know, the actual expected performance should be clearly identified here, you know, right up front, and then everything below it is going to be supporting that. Um, a quick example is, of course, an uptime. So the expectation is that there is a 100% uptime. If, if that is what the um, particular SLA is. Also metrics, you want to be sure to detail how the measure, how we're measuring the expected performance. Um, is it a monthly measurement, an annual measurement? Does it accumulate or start fresh each period? How is it calculated? Possibly even providing examples of that calculation within the SLA document. The responsibilities on each party, who is responsible for delivering the SLA, um, who's identifying, uh, responsible for identifying any missed SLAs, uh, what about reporting? Um, is reporting expected? Should you have to ask for it? Is it automatic? All those things should be included in that. And then finally, an escalation a path, of course, if an SLA is missed, there needs to be a, a a definition, a path on how um, you are to bring that up with the vendor and how there is a response period and how they will respond to it. So these are just a few items to consider. There's other items on here. Um, the most important thing is to make it as straightforward as possible with little room for ambiguity. Um, it's not an easy thing to do to write SLAs. It's even harder to keep track of and measure them so as uh, the more simply they can be written, the better. Our second poll question of the day is, do you ensure your SLAs are integrated within your critical vendor contracts? Yes, no, or not sure? Kelly, I have another question here that we can go ahead and answer. And that question is, why is it necessary to include a glossary of terms in a contract or agreement? Well, the simplest answer is because it will help remove ambiguity. And it doesn't matter who you happen to have a contract with, whether it's with a vendor or a contractor or any other uh, party um, to a contract. One of the biggest sources of misunderstanding is just definitions, key terminology. Some people um, may have a different um, understanding of exactly what that clause or that terminolo terminology is meaning. So whether you actually have a, a section within the contract that presents the defined terminology or it's defined throughout the contract, I've seen it done both ways, regardless of how it's done, um, I think it is a critical part of any contract, whether it's with your vendor again or with anyone else, just to make sure that when you go into that contractual relationship, that again, there is clarity on everyone's part as to what um, what both sides are signing up for. And that includes um, defining necessary terms in the agreement. Maybe there's some addendums or exhibits, definitely within the SLA, within the SOW, whatever documents might be associated with that contractual relationship. Those definitions are necessary throughout those documents. Okay, here are those results. Thanks again, everyone, for taking the time to answer the poll. I would like to quickly direct your attention to the related content widget where you will find our eight vendor service level agreement best practices infographic. As we just covered service level agreements, this is a handy resource to download to learn more best practices. Okay, Kelly, let's continue with the presentation. 
So we just talked about what should be included in the SLAs and getting them documented in the contract, but when should you begin reviewing the SLAs? To start with, as I mentioned earlier, you really should begin thinking about the SLAs during the due diligence process. So when you are gathering the specific details about the product or service and the vendor and collaborating with your team, during that time you're uncovering what your expectations are of this new vendor. But the formal review of the SLA will happen at the contract stage. That's when you have the contract in hand. Uh, this is when you certainly will want to review, you know, again, with those collaborators to make sure that everybody is in line with the SLAs and that the SLAs cover everything that you expect and that it is clearly written. Uh, as I mentioned before, it can be very convoluted sometimes and um, and may be misunderstood, so it's, this is where you really want to make sure that everybody that is a part of this product and service and the delivery of it and, and support of it should be uh, reviewing that to make sure that it is clear what the, what the SLAs are saying. And this is, as just as the contract phase is, not a one and done process. The SLA management along with contract management is an ongoing process. and. You know, you'll probably find as you get into the relationship with the vendor that maybe the SLAs need, you know, some tweaking here or there. So just, uh, you know, be sure to monitor that process along the way and when time permits, uh, maybe it's at an annual review or at a um, renewal of the contract, if some changes need to be made to that SLA at that time, be sure that you're prepared to make those. One of the most important things to convey um, about SLAs is that there is no one size fits all. It is truly dependent on you, the, the vendor, and the solution, the, pro the product or the service or, or um, the, whatever the solution is that you are putting in place. Again, that information that you gather and that initial due diligence review will help you identify what the risks are um, with this particular vendor and this particular service that you, so that you can address them with the SLAs. But there are so many SLA, so many ways that SLAs can be tailored uh, to fit the product or the service. Um, so again, there's not a um, off-the-shelf set of SLAs that you could use. But here's just a few common ones that I could at least reference to uh, make you start thinking about the SLAs you might need. For example, uh, if you are uh, working with a service that is providing some kind of call center or support center for you, then you would obviously want SLA language around um, call answer rate, um, abandonment rate, uh, probably satisfaction rate. If you are um, uh, buying a service that is a hosted solution, um, then you probably want to have an SLA around handling defects and the defect rate. Um, for any software service, of course, you certainly want to have an SLA around uptime. That one is definitely the most common one. Again, one final point on this is that depending on uh, the vendor and the product or products that you are purchasing with that vendor, you could have more than one set of SLAs because a set of SLAs may not be appropriate for every service that you have in place with that vendor. So again, time spent with your collaborators in putting the SLAs in place, getting them appropriately set up so that um, each one is appropriate to the solution that it is in place for is very important to having successful SLAs. So you put the SLAs in place for a reason and hopefully you're monitoring them and there are times when an SLA is broken. That, that's life and it happens. So what should you do? First and foremost, you do want to act quickly. You certainly want to, you know, establish a meeting with that uh, vendor. Hopefully you're having routine meetings with that vendor. Um, but in, in the case of a missed SLA, you certainly want to have one. You certainly do want to make sure that the appropriate leadership knows, whether that is senior management, the board, depending on the account, it could be the board. All of that should be um, governed by your uh, vendor management uh, policies and program. Um, you may want to consider an on-site visit or audit with that vendor, depending on how serious the um, the missed SLA is, um, and then you will at that time want to definitely reevaluate the SLAs. Remember I had mentioned just a moment ago that 
Um, you may find that the SLAs aren't exactly appropriate when you put them in place. Well, that may be what you find here. And hopefully, again, you went into this relationship with this vendor in a good partnership approach. Um, and so you both will find ways to, to make this SLA work and the relationship work. But in the end, if it's not working and if it's not the right vendor and they're not able to produce the way the expectations were then, you know, there, you may end up having to exit the relationship. Um, this is where, you know, yeah, we'll talk about exiting in just a few moments too, but this is definitely an option if SLAs continue to be missed, um, if you've gone through these steps with the vendor to try to put better processes in place, better relationship in place, uh, a partnership in place to try to um, figure out what isn't working to satisfy the SLA. If none of that is working, then um, at the in the end, um, in the end, the option of exiting the relationship may be the only option that you have. The, the point of this message is this is why you put the SLAs in place and make sure that they're appropriately written up front so that you do have those rights. So this brings us to our third agenda item, which is ongoing contract management. And um, it's a very simple statement here that um, contract management does not end when the contract is signed. Um, it's, just, it's just an ongoing life cycle, just like your vendor relationship is a life cycle. You should not... Um, put a contract in place, sign it, and file it away, and forget about it. Um, as you are reviewing your relationship with your vendor, the contract should be reviewed um, as well. So just remember both contract management um, and vendor management does not end um, with, the, with one event. It is an ongoing life cycle that needs to be managed. So what exactly are we talking about when we say ongoing vendor contract management? Uh, there's a few things in particular that you want to review. We've, we've talked about all of these along the way. Uh, one is definitely tracking those renewal dates. You certainly want to always be reminded of them, uh, reminded of your notification periods for a variety of things, whether it is determination of the contract, uh, notification periods on breach events or anything like that. These are the things you just want to, as you review your vendor on an annual basis, if that's the time period you're reviewing, just take a quick look at that contract to remind you of these things as well. Uh, this is where you would want to also um, schedule some regular meetings to address the service delivery and any deliverables that they may be having. This is back to the SLAs that you hopefully have in place and you're just you know, making sure that everything is going as planned with the vendor. These are likely things like quarterly business reviews. That's a very meaningful exercise with your vendor. Um, maybe not all vendors, but certainly your most critical ones. And the QBRs give both sides a chance to show off what has been done, talk about what's coming, and it's also a chance to address concerns. Uh, again, monitoring those SLAs, um, it, it kind of fits into all of the above. And then this is where you also, as you are doing an on annual review of your contract, identifying any gaps that might exist with that contract. I mentioned that a few slides back too, that there may be times that you need to um, consider some kind of modification because maybe a new regulation has surfaced or um, something has changed with your relationship with that vendor and so you just need to address uh, a gap in the contract with them. So those are the things that you would be doing as part of an ongoing contract review. So this brings us to our fourth agenda item and talking about termination. So there certainly needs to be a great deal of attention and effort um, in your contract on termination. It's very important that your termination language and definition of termination is uh, very clearly defined and both parties truly understand uh, what termination rights exist. And, and also that's important to have uh, that defined based on the type of document because 
in a lot of cases you have a master agreement that's in place and then other agreements that um, are children to that parent master agreement. So that definition of termination for each of those agreements need to be clearly understood as well. A, a very important part of a termination right is whether there is an auto renewal clause in the contract. Uh, this is a very common clause to have in all contracts and it just states that if you don't state you're going to terminate within your termination period rights then the contract will automatically renew and you have a notification period in there to um, to let the other party in the contract know that you are indeed terminating and if you don't then it goes into that auto renewal period um, and then there's a termination process. There's, you know, either there's a specific way that it has to be terminated, uh, whether it's written or actually mailed. You know, um, that's still a part. That's still very common these days. Uh, so those kinds of um, definition uh, and um, details, not definition, but details, need to be identified in the contract to be very clearly understand what termination provisions exist in the contract. And, the, and so that both parties understand that. So there are a few ways that a contract can terminate. First, it can terminate just because it hits its expiration date. Um, let's just say it's a contract that doesn't have that auto renewal clause in it. It likely has an expiration date. And so um, when it hits that expiration date, it would expire unless both parties agree to extend that term. Um, there are some contracts that are considered perpetual. That means they don't expire. So if there is no language in the contract about a, a termination process or an expiration of that contract, then it's considered a perpetual contract. I mean, it could terminate because of breach or some other cause and likely uh, there's language around um, the party, the non breaching party having a cure period, typically of around 30 days. Um, so in the event that that cure period isn't satisfied, then there is a right to terminate due to breach or cause. Um, some contracts can include a contract language for convenience termination. Um, convenience termination generally means that the contract can be terminated at any point in time with the appropriate notice that's written into the contract, typically 90 days, but it could be anything other than that. Um, convenience clauses um, are definitely one-sided and, um, you know, some, something that uh, certainly needs to be negotiated in uh, most of your contracts, either negotiated in or negotiated out, whichever is important to you. And then early termination, maybe you have some an early termination right um, that may not be one of the reasons above. There, I don't know, there could be reasons for um, budgetary reasons, funding reasons, um, merger acquisition reasons, whatever reasons there may be. You may have some early termination rights that would typically come along with some penalties, um, but those rights could be listed in the contract as well. So let's end our termination discussion talking about what your rights are post-termination. Uh, you want to make sure, and if this is a, a, a relationship that you have with a vendor that is um, managing things for you, maybe providing deliverables for you, you certainly want to have some uh, transition language in the contract that talks about how they're going to support you post termination for a period of time? Um, how are you going to access the items? Do you still have access to the piece of software or whatever it is that you have? Um, how, how long will you have it? How will they support you in transitioning to another service? Things like that. So you want to have good, strong transition language in there. There could be some costs associated with it and you would want to have that understood and written in the contract as well. Um, data ownership is a huge one, so you certainly want to have that clarified that what what happens to your data post termination and if the requirement is that your uh, that the other party destructs the data, then you would want to have that in the contract as well, including the um, receipt of a certificate of destruction. Confidentiality rights certainly need to continue post-termination, so you want to ensure that the survival 
contract um, provision is thorough and covers the things that you want to cover, but specifically calling out uh, confidentiality. And then you need to understand um, what kind of access, if any, you have to licenses uh, that might have been granted to you post-termination. So, uh, Jesse, I think that brings us to our last poll question. Our next poll question is, do your contracts with vendors identify what will happen to your data upon termination? Yes, no, or not sure? Kelly, let's answer another question from the audience. And this question is, who should draft an SLA with the third parties, legal or the business owner? I think everybody would have a different answer to this question, but in my perspective, the business owner should take the lead in drafting the SLAs because they are the closest to the day-to-day -day operations of whatever um, support service product that you're purchasing from that vendor. They have the boots on the ground, so to speak, and so they really understand how that product or service should be working and should be um, delivering and should be delivered. So they, the business owner should have a, um, a significant role in that process. Now that they would likely not be the only person building those SLAs, legal obviously would want to have some hand in that as would others within the organization. Um, but your primary uh, drafters of your biz of your SLA should be the people that are closest to supporting the business, and then there would be collaborators across the organization that would probably be involved or should be involved just to make sure that all of the um, legalese that should be included in the SLAs are included. Thanks, Kelly. Just a reminder, if you have any issues submitting your poll answers, please feel free to send us a message via the Ask Question widget, and we will be happy to assist. We've got about five seconds left, so please submit those answers. Thank you. Here are those results. Thank you to everyone for answering this question. It's always interesting to see what everyone says. I'd like to mention that you'll find our What to Consider for Vendor Contract Renegotiations or Amendments infographic available for download in the related content widget. This helpful resource walks you through how to renegotiate a contract during the active contract term. Kelly, I'll pass it back to you. So throughout the presentation, I've tried to uh, reference several things that you need to uh, be mindful of or best practices. I may not have called out each one of these um, along the way, but I do want to run through these to make sure that um, that we end with these, these particular key takeaways. There's probably more, but these are the ones I want to bring attention to. Again, clearly define the contract signing authority, and that needs to be done within your um, policy program. Uh, this is something that is very instrumental to a contract management process. You need to understand all of those termination rights. Uh, we just talked about those, so you need to make sure what your rights are with uh, with termination and um, what notification periods you have along with that. You need to monitor the vendor's performance throughout the relationship, that contract relationship, um, especially as it relates to SLAs, if you have SLAs in place, and hopefully you do. Uh, you need to have plans and negotiation and the strategy. This is um, something that would be done prior to the engagement, so it probably should have been number one, uh, but you do need to plan that negotiation and strategy so that you know what to expect when going into that contractual relationship. Uh, use a reliable tool or solution for contract storage. As we talked about, tracking those dates, keeping track of the contracts, knowing where they are, that's vital to having a thorough understanding of your contractual relationship with all of your third parties. Uh, make sure that you do have procedures um, written for dispute resolution, that they're clearly defined and, and each party understands what that means. I don't know that I touched much on that, but certainly 
uh, want to call that out. You do want to manage to the risks that you identified in that due diligence process when you were initially vetting that vendor. So remember that all of that starts at the very beginning before you ever get into this contract. You are doing an initial vetting of the vendor so that the contract can cover all of the things that you uncovered during that, um, during that process. Uh, back to the SLAs, make sure they're straightforward. Remember I talked about that. You need to be as um, clear as possible so that it doesn't allow for ambiguity. It's really hard to do with SLAs, but make them straightforward so they're easily monitored and they can actually be um, monitor, managed easily. And then understand that vendor contract management doesn't end with the contract signing. Just remember that just as you are managing your vendor on an ongoing basis, you are also managing that contract on an ongoing basis. And that comes to the end of the presentation, and I will turn it back over to you, Jesse. Great, thanks so much, Kelly. Before we dive into more questions and answers, I want to thank everyone for attending. I would also like to thank Kelly for her time in sharing some important information. On your screen now, you will see our upcoming webinars. On August 24th, our Performing a Complete Vendor Contract Review webinar. And on September 5th, our Third Party Risk Management in the Hidden Factors of Success webinar. We hope you'll be able to join us for those sessions. A link to register for those is in your copy of today's presentation slides. Let's now go ahead and answer some more questions that have come in during this session. Okay, Kelly, the next question is, how do you manage SLAs? Um, well, the best way to manage SLAs is to ensure that uh, somebody has the responsibility to manage them. It's real easy um, to not get managed if nobody knows they have the ownership or the ultimate responsibility. Another thing that really needs to be done is to know what um, contracts actually include SLAs. We probably should start there. What contracts include SLAs? Make sure those are identified. Again, back to this needing to have a central repository where all your contracts are. There also needs to be some kind of um, uh, capturing of key data, key metadata within that contract, and the SLAs would be one of those. So you have to know where your contracts are stored, of which contracts you have with vendors, which ones have SLAs, and then based on the vendor and the product, um, somebody needs to be tasked with the responsibility of managing those SLAs. And then in managing those SLAs, you're you know going to want to ensure that you're getting the performance reports from the vendors that you expect, whether it is based on whatever time period it is that it's actually being monitored and tracked, and if there are any issues or uh, missed SLAs that you are managing that through some kind of issue management process, and that um, that there that there's a full cycle of uh, re getting the information from the vendor on the SLAs, reviewing the information on the SLAs tracking whether it's um, um, uh, aligned as you would expect it to be aligned or not, following up on issues, and it's a full circle and all the way back around again until you get the next set of SLA. So it's just a pretty lengthy, comp not complicated, but step-by-step -step process that should be put in place. There you go. Great. Thanks, Kelly. Next question. Is there a risk of putting audit rights in a contract and then not performing that audit? Um, so, first of all, I'm not a lawyer, so keep that in mind with my response. Um, from my perspective on what I have seen in in real life and in um, our, our cases and what we do here, um, I, I would say no, for the most part, there's not much there's not a great risk by not uh, performing that audit. I, I will say, though, on the flip side of that is, if that audit language in the contract has some um, cure period around anything that's found, and then say you come in a few years into the contract and decide all of a sudden you want to audit, and you discovered something that happened in year one, and you didn't, you didn't, um, I guess, 
issue uh, um, issue have an issue with the vendor at that point in time and you didn't give them a chance to cure you've probably missed an opportunity to have an issue resolved so on the one side i say no there's there's no risk if everything's going well with that vendor but as soon as something doesn't go well with that vendor and the services they are providing you and you aren't performing those audits then you're probably missing out on opportunities to um to uh, call out, call them out on it for one, and to uh, receive whatever penalties would have been associated with with that audit finding if there had been one. So that's kind of an iffy answer. I apologize about that. It goes both ways. Great. Our next question. We have a template that legal created that is used to send vendors when a contract is ended. Who is responsible for following up with the vendor, a business unit, vendor management, et cetera? Well, that goes back to who has, you know, contract management responsibility within your organization. It's probably going to land uh, with that wherever that is, and each one of you would probably be different. Um, what's important to note here is that it needs to be established in your organization who does have contract management responsibility. It needs to be um, documented in your governance documents, your policy program, et cetera, and then all um, appropriate uh, parties within the organization need to understand what that policy is, what the contract mon management process is, so that everybody is following whatever the steps you have put in place are. I would say in most cases, contract management, depending on the organization, is going to fall within either procurement or uh, risk management, sometimes finance. It, it really, it really, if you have a legal department in, in house, absolutely could fall there as well. So it's going to be any number of places based on you, but each of you, wherever it is, should have that structure around it. Great, next question. Should my contracts for my low risk vendors be different than my contracts for my critical or high risk vendors? Yeah, there's probably some of those provisions that I listed on that one slide, um, right to audit, data protection agreements, maybe even SLAs that may not be necessary for your low risk vendors, really in a lot of cases won't be necessary for your low risk vendors. So you may have, you know, if you have your own contract templates, which hopefully you do, you may have two contract templates, one that's for low risk, one that's for all other vendors. Um, and there could be, you know, several of those provisions that are stripped from that. Um, still needs to follow the same contract management process, regardless of what provisions are in that document, in that contract template. So you still need to have, you know, the governance that states how the contract needs to be managed, um, authorized, approved, stored, reviewed. The reviewing part of the contract, uh, because it's a low risk vendor, would certainly not be as often on the same schedule as your high risk and critical vendors would be, but yet would have some kind of review cycle. So likely could be different contracts, just a slightly different language in your low risk vendors that still needs to follow the contract management process. Great, we have time for one more question. What do you recommend if we can't have all of our contracts reviewed by a legal counsel? Yeah, and that's, you know, depending on your organization, that's likely the case for many of you um, and to be quite honest with you is the case with us as well um, so you should have and again this goes back to your governance documents to your policy and your program you probably have identified there have some kind of indication as to maybe a dollar value of the contract or um, a, um, a re restriction around what data is being shared with that particular vendor, something like that might trigger for your organization when a um, uh, when your legal team, whether that's outside counsel or inside counsel, um, will need to be involved in the contract. You may also have a stipulation around if 
your vendor that you're working with is not willing to review your contract template, but they print it, present you with their contract that uh, they want to use, maybe that is another um, stipulation that would require outside counsel. So I think, yes, it's an added cost for sure, but but there are likely those, you know, specific scenarios like those I just mentioned that need to be carved out for outside counsel review or some other review, maybe not outside counsel, maybe there's a maybe you have some paralegal assistance you could you could have reviewing that with you. <clears throat> but I think in the end you should have some kind of parameters on when legal advice is probably required. Sorry I'm losing my voice. <clears throat> Thanks Kelly. Unfortunately that is all the time we have left for questions today. Thank you, Kelly, for taking the time to address some of those that came in. Any questions we did not have time to answer today, we will address offline. We would like to thank you all for attending and hope you found today's session valuable. A big thank you to Kelly for her time and content. You can ask even more questions inside of our third-party think tank and online community that is dedicated to third-party risk professionals and free to join. Just because today's session has ended doesn't mean the conversations and questions must. Post your questions at thirdpartythinktank.com and see what your peers have to say. In the community, you'll find thousands of free educational resources related to vendor contract management to assist you. If you'd like to become a member of Third Party Think Tank, you can register on the site or shoot us an email and we'll get you registered and send you a link to set your password. We did record today's session and that recording link will be provided to you in a follow-up email that you will receive tomorrow afternoon. Also in that follow-up email will be the survey link for you to request a CPE credit. On behalf of Venminder, it has been a pleasure. Thank you and have a great rest of your day.